Brown, and I am the president of the Latino Medical Student Association, LMSA, here at NYITCOM in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, if you don't know where that is, it's, a, a, it's an hour east of Memphis, okay? So kind of around the Memphis area. No, ma'am, it's west. an hour west of Memphis. <laughs> west. West? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> um, thank you, for everyone, for coming in. I want to um, thank the pre-meds that are joining us tonight. Um, just feel free to ask any questions. Um, there's no dumb question when it comes to pre-med. We we're here to help you guys. Uh, I bet you I had those questions and even more questions when I was in your shoes. So don't feel shy. This is not the time. We're here to help you. Uh, thank you, the student doctors, for coming in and helping me tonight. I know we have a lot going on, first years and second years. Thank you. And um, Dr. Owens, thank you for helping me host this. Um, we do have a few individuals that are part of the uh, admissions committee or part of admissions. So um, if we have a specific admission question and we don't know anything, we can definitely refer back to them. They can always answer that for us. Um, so the way this is going to work, we're going to have a quick presentation. Um, this is our first episode, so we're going to talk about kind of introducing what it is to be a pre-med, um, any prerequisites, what is, what is that like? Um, I can talk about that for hours, so this is going to be a hot topic. Um, our second episode is going to be an MCAT edit edition, um, kind of giving you tips of how to study and more details about the MCAT. Then we're going to have an, our fourth episode is going to be, or I'm sorry, our third episode is going to be the application process and then the interview process at the end. Um, so please feel free to join us wherever time. If you have questions that don't relate anything to whatever episode, please just feel free to ask whatever. Um, so from there, uh, feel free to put any questions on the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, or at the end, we'll have a Q&A with our student panels and uh, we'll go from there. So our presenter tonight is Jessica Linares. She is from Houston, Texas. She graduated from the University of Houston with a major in biochemistry and a minor in chemistry. And she is the vice president of the LMSA chapter here in Jonesboro. All right, Jessica, take it away. All right, y'all. Hi again. You know, Sonia already introduced me, but my name is Jessica Linares. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now. This is my first time, so just bear with me if it doesn't look the way it should. Um, can y'all see my presentation now? I don't know how to make it full screen. <laughs> We're waiting. There we go. Oh, then, yeah. okay. okay. Okay, present. Oh, I think that's going to present from that slide. Oh, let me see. <laughs> that's okay. You can start over. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, y'all. So yeah, this is a presentation on pre-med. Um, what I wanted to, when Sonia and I were talking about doing these series, we wanted to focus on pre-med, but then it occurred to me that you might also be interested in hearing a little bit more about just health in general, the healthcare system. So I went ahead and also included nursing, uh, what a nurse practitioner is and what a physician assistant is before I get into the pre-med. Um, just to give you a more well-rounded um, approach, if that's if healthcare is something that you wanted to go ahead and pursue. Oh, that's my picture. <laughs> okay, so again, um, this is more of a comprehensive approach of healthcare. Of course, this is not an all-inclusive list. There's so much more to healthcare, but I just went ahead and included these um, three things. So the uh, scope of nursing, those are the people that are more... Um, at bedside with the patient, they give medications, they take care of the patient more hands-on. Um, just, you know, I added some points here. So they manage the care, they, uh, they're good at administrating like vaccines also. They promote the care of the patient. Um, they also promote or provide them with comfort and care. Um, and they also are in charge of doing some of the discharge stuff and talking about their paperwork when it gets to that. So just a little bit on their education, you can go ahead and get, become an RN or a registered nurse by getting your associate's degree. That takes about 18 to 24 months. You just have to take the NCLEX and pass that. And then if you wanna broaden your knowledge, you can go ahead and pursue a bachelor's in nursing. And by that point, you would have already taken your NCLEX and that's four years. I know that there are some bridging programs. So if you wanted to go ahead and do an associate's degree and then apply to a bachelor's degree, it can be an additional two years. So really total four years. And there's a, the salary. I think it more than anything 
depends on where you're living or where you're working and what the start pay is. Also, whether you're a day shift or night shift nurse. So then what is a nurse practitioner and physician assistant? I personally didn't know what this was until I started working as a scribe in the emergency department. So what they are, they're also clinicians. They can see their own patients. They write their own orders. They see the patient. They come up with the care plan for the patient, how to manage them. Um, they do work alongside a physician, though. So the physician has to basically sign off and be okay with the treatment plan for them to take care of that patient. And for the education, for an NP specifically, you have to get a bachelor's in nursing, so your BSN. Um, and they do require you to work one to two years as a nurse, so you can get some of that clinical experience. You also have to take the GRE, which is um, the graduate's admissions test, and a minimum of 300, same for PA. A lot of these things are going to in, um, overlap between, between these two. And, um, and for an NP, you do have to specialize, like if you wanted to do a specific uh, field, but that's a little bit different for PA, and the average amount of time for that education total is seven and ten years. So for a PA, you have to get your bachelor's degree, um, which can take three to four years. And these are some prerequisites that I got off of their website that you want. They need, they want you to take A and P, biology, chemistry, and microbio. Also, you have to take the GRE. They also want you to do some clinical experience. I know. Many people would work as a scribe or they'd get some experience as an EMT, just anything that you can get within the office. And then you graduate with a master's in PA, or you can also get a doctorate. It takes a little bit more time. So the total years is about seven altogether, and their average salary is very similar also, if that's what you're interested in. So now, talking about what does a DO and MD stand for? So a DO is what we are, pursuing right now at NYT Com. Um, that's doctor of osteopathic medicine. And then there's allopathic doctors, which are the MDs. It's um, their degree is doctor of medicine. So what do we do? We're here to promote the well-being of all of our patients and try to improve their quality of living. So our prerequisites are pretty much the same. It just really depends on the school and which you're applying to. What I included in this slide is really directed more for NYTCOM. I pulled this off of our website. So as you can see, they're pretty basic. It's your English, you have to take English one and two, your bio one and two with the labs, Gen, Gen Chem one and two, and organic one and two with the labs. For us though, Biochemistry is encouraged, it's not recommended, but you can also switch that out for your organic too if you didn't want to take organic too, because you know we all know that's kind of hard. <laughs> and then there's also the physics labs for one and two. So for the MCAT, just a little bit of information on it. I know that we're gonna have another series on it, but I just thought it'd be nice to include it also. So the average scores, well, not the average score, sorry. The range is 472 to 528. The 50th percentile is 501, and the 74th percentile is 508. I know for our class, I think our average is a 506 right now, just so you're aware of you know, what you wanna strive for when and if you plan on taking the MCAT. And you do wanna get some letters of recommendation. You wanna get that from your pre-health committee. I know A-State has one, so that's whenever you submit like your personal statement, um, your grades, and then they grade you and say like, yeah, we recommend this uh, student or no, we don't recommend this student. And then they kind of help you uh, try to improve on certain things also to make your application better. Um, you can also do three letters of recommendations, two from faculty. One has to be science, one from a supervisor, uh, service, research, or clinical experience. I personally did um, five total. I did two for my undergrad professors, and then I did three physicians. So our education, again, within medical school is very similar. The only difference between it is that we have um, OMT or osteopathic medical techniques that we have to, or manipulative techniques that we learn. And that's an additional 200 hours at least. Um, so what this is essentially is us being able to provide a different type of treatment for patients. Um, it's more hands-on. So we do look at the patients more holistically. And um, our residencies are the same, three to seven years. And if you want to subspecialize in anything, that's one to three years. And there's our average salary. Again, it depends on the specialty, when, where you go and practice and if you're starting or not. So some important things that you want to consider as a pre-med is having a good personal statement. I know for me that was real, like, what is a good personal statement? So I personally, um, 
looked online just to read what a lot of people wrote and people have really good ones, but honestly, it's just like whatever you think or what, what is it that makes you want to become a doctor? And it has to be something that comes from within you. You know, they're going to be able to tell the ambitions, whether or not this is a story from you and this is something that you experience. And this is the reason why you want to pursue medicine for volunteering. It doesn't have to be at school. You can do a community clinic or hospital. Um, you can even volunteer with a pre-med organization. The thing though about the pre-med organization, it's very important to actually be an active member. Yes, go to the meetings, but you know, that's just going to show that you weren't just going to the meetings. You were actively trying to, you know, promote your organization and be involved. For clinical experience, I mentioned this before, prescribing and shadowing. Um, I think I was personally a scribe, so I'm more biased for scribing only because like when I worked with physicians, they said that they preferred scribes in the sense that you actually get to see like what the doctor is thinking, like how they put in orders, what, you know, like what they're thinking the patient has. So you get to see the thought process and kind of learn from that also, and also research. So this is just something that we pulled off of the osteopathic, oh my gosh, admin, admissions, I think. Um, this is something that they have as recommendations. So throughout your undergrad, so for freshman year, they want you to go ahead and meet with your pre-health advisor. So I think the sooner that you start, the better to, you know, kind of set up your plan. Like, this is what I want to do. These are the letters I need to get. These are the grades I need to get. And again, I'll, of course, start your prereqs. Join pre-health organizations, like I mentioned previously, and actually be an active member. And, you know, you can pursue leadership roles there too. Develop that relationship with your science faculty members because those are the people that you're going to be asking letters of recommendation. And you want them to be personal. You want them to write something that they actually know about you, not just another student. And for your uh, sophomore year, start thinking about taking that MCAT. You know, it's, it's a long test. It has a lot of stuff on there and it's important. So, you know, if this is what you want to do, you have to start thinking about it earlier rather than sooner if you're a traditional student. Attend the recruiting events. I know for my undergrad, they would have medical schools come and talk to us about why we should go to their school, like what do they have to offer. So it's important to kind of get the gist of like knowing, do I fit in with this school and are they gonna be good for me also? Um, continue being involved throughout your second year. And then again, look for opportunities to shadow volunteer and do research. So for your junior year, this is when you really have to buckle down and say, okay, this is when I'm going to take the MCAT. I need to really study for this. Who am I going to ask for these letters of recommendation? And you have to give them time ahead so they can write those letters and you're not kind of rushing them, you know. Um, for the spring, you take the MCAT, um, you get your score back and you see, okay, what schools do I want to apply to? You make your list and then you submit your application as soon as possible. I think that's the most important thing I can suggest pre-meds. I know people told me apply early and I didn't realize how important it was until I applied and I said, oh my gosh, I should have heard them, but really apply early, that's like your main thing. And then for the summer, you could just go ahead and submit your MCAT scores if you haven't gotten that back. Also, if you're currently taking any classes that you want the school to see. Um, and then for your fourth year, you just wait for your application. You wait to get invited. Um, you wait for your final grades to come up. And once you interview, you know, you just wait until you get that acceptance if that school wants you. And if not, that's perfectly fine. You can always take a gap year. I took two gap years. Um, it's good to have a, a plan B just, you know, so you're prepared mentally. You know, it's a lot of hard work but life, you know, happens and it's perfectly fine. So, oh, I, I didn't read that one. So yeah, get feedback from schools. If you don't get accepted, which is again, totally fine. You can work on things. They want to see if you're a reapplicant, what have you improved on? What did you do now um, to make you a better applicant? I know a lot of people take master's programs also, which was pretty great um, just to get you more information, um, especially I think there's like specifically medical, school geared master's programs that kind of help you once you're in medical school it's like oh yeah i saw that in my master's program um yeah and just enjoy take vacation <laughs> beforehand i think that's really important do some mental health care and then one thing that um nytcom is planning to offer now is they're partnering up with a state to have a bs ndo 
duo program. So what this is, it's still in the works, just so you guys know. So it's, we don't have any students currently. Our New York campus does though. And what this is, um, you, for this one, if it's a three year program, you have to commit in your high school and say, this is what I'm gonna go ahead and do. So then you're gonna do your bachelor's degree in three years. And then they're going to interview you as a senior in college. And then you'll know beforehand, before you're, you know, like done with your senior year, whether or not you got accepted. And this is just some criteria. You have to have a GPA of a 3.5 and whatever the average MCAT is, you have to have that or above. You have to complete all your prereqs, like the ones we talked about previously, and you can't have a grade below a C. You have to have the favorable recommendation for your uh, pre-medical committee, and you have to pass the interview. <laughs> We also have a four plus four year program or agreement. I think that one's might be a little bit nicer in the terms that you don't have to, you know, blow past your undergrad. You get four years to do that completely. But again, we're still working on this. So it's not set in stone, but we did just want to go ahead and let you guys know to look out for this if you're interested in it. And that's really it for my presentation. If you guys have any questions, feel free. How do I stop sharing? Stop share. All right, thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful presentation. So for the student panel, um, before we jump into question and answers, I want you guys to go ahead and um, kind of take turns, introduce yourself, where you're from, where did you graduate from, what's your major, um, and are you a traditional or non-traditional student, um, medical student? Um, and we can start it off with the first person I see is Spencer. <laughs> uh oh uh okay hi guys i'm spencer i am a non-traditional i'm an older student i graduated uh, with a bachelor of science in nursing in 2013 from texas christian university and then i uh, worked as a nurse for about six years i was icu and emergency and so i didn't want to be a doctor for a long time uh my, my friends would occasionally be like hey man you should you should go to medical school and i i was like no i have absolutely no interest in that uh had an admission to nurse practitioner school and ended up having kind of a lightning bolt moment and ended up throwing that away and uh, applying to med school. So I can kind of, I, if, if anybody has any questions about what the non-traditional process looks like or uh, somebody who had weaker grades in uh, the first run at undergrad or, you know, prior career, anything like that, I can, I can definitely help out with that. So. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, Julia. Hi everyone, my name is Julia. I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, I'm a first year. I went to college at Grinnell College, which is a small school in Iowa where I majored in biology and Spanish. And then I went to Loyola University to get my master's in medical science. So it's kind of like what Jessica was talking about, that master's program that's more medical school geared. Um, and then I took a year off and was scribing and then I started med, med school. So. Uh, Michaela. Hey guys, I'm Michaela. I'm originally from North Carolina, so pretty far away. Um, I'm also a non-traditional student. I graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, and then I worked in research for two years before applying to medical school. Um, so if you have any questions about research or anything like that, I can definitely answer. I have Miss Dimple next. Hi everyone, I'm Dimple. Um, I'm a non-traditional student as well. I went to a small liberal arts college here in Arkansas um, in Conway, Hendricks College. And I got my major in biochemistry, molecular biology with a minor in business. And then I did a two year master's of public health in Little Rock at UAMS. And I'm a second year student now. Thank you, and then Emily. Hi everyone, I'm Emily. I went to the University of Rochester. I'm a non-traditional student. I majored in computer science. I took two gap years, one including working as a software engineer and then my second gap year getting a master's in global medicine. So if you have any questions in terms of gap years, engineering, transitioning, I am your girl. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess I didn't really introduce myself. So I am a second year now. Um, I went to UT Austin, that's where I graduated from with the biochemistry major. I grew up in Dallas, 
And I did take two years off to work as a medical assistant in dermatology. So I'm all about the skin now. Um, but yeah, if you have any more questions, um, you've heard all of us. We are, I think the majority of us are non-traditional, which is um, actually um, different than what, what I was expecting. But uh, does anybody have any questions for the panel? Um, you could throw it on the chat. Uh, if not, I got a couple of questions for the panel. If um, no one wants to go ahead and take a stab at it. Don't be afraid of us. We were, we were in your shoes very, very, very recently. Absolutely. So I guess with that, um, I guess I'll ask a couple of you. Um, how did you guys uh, juggle classes and extracurriculars? Uh, you sounded like you guys were pretty busy pre-meds. So how did you guys handle that? Um, any tips that you could give to our audience? So I can go ahead and answer this one. So I was not an active member for my <laughs> pre-medical organization, which is why I'm like, please be active. Cause I know whenever um, I got, I didn't get feedback, but I was like, man, whenever I'm applying, I can't say that I did anything in my, <laughs> with my organization besides attend the meetings. But what I did for undergrad, essentially I worked because I needed to pay for school. So I didn't really have, anything I didn't have a chance to do research unfortunately I did it because of biochem my biochem class required it but nothing other than that but I we would just work as a scribe um so that, that's pretty much it see I'm just trying to open up the the field here that we, we're not like perfect either you know like we had some roadblocks like I know I needed to work I couldn't I wasn't the perfect applicant either I didn't have the research I didn't have a lot of extracurricular or volunteering and that's okay I want to provide a little bit of a counter perspective on the uh, on the med uh, medical society, you know, letter of rec and stuff. Um, so I was already working full time. Uh, the nice thing about nursing is that you work three twelves a week. So I had four days a week off. So I would schedule my classes on uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and then work Tuesday, Thursday, and you know, Saturday or Sunday. Um, and that worked out, out. That worked out really well. But um, uh, my the medical advisor at, uh, at, at the school I was going to, um, at, for the, for my prereqs for med school, uh, was like, yeah, you need to go shadow a doctor, you know? And I was like, I, that's no, I work with doctors every day. Why would I do that? You know? So, and I, and I would encourage you if you have significant clinical experience or if you spend a lot of time scribing, you know, honestly, to some degree, I think that, that, that can, that time spent shadowing a doctor can come across as like insincere or box checking um, if you already have something else. And I, so I straight up refused to do that because I I was old and be. Uh, and the other, the other thing was uh, the, the letter of rec. I had people that I worked with clinically, you know, managers, uh, students that I had taught, you know, people who I was excited for the letters that they could provide me and the unique perspective that they could provide on me as a teacher, as a learner, or as a, as an employee or whatever, uh, doctors, I had a doctor that I worked with. Um, and so that was something else I just straight up refused to do. I said, I, why would I want an impersonal letter, you know, from a committee that doesn't know me because I'm, you know, 27 years old and I'm coming to class here three days a week. So, so it's, not necessarily one size fits all. I think that the committee is a great route to go, especially for people who spend a lot of time on their undergrad institution campus, but uh, just know that I didn't even have one and you can still get in. It's still possible. As a different oh. Go ahead. As a different perspective, just to emphasize, if your university does provide a committee letter, it is quite important. Um, if you are an undergrad and you're within that time range and you don't have this non-traditional path that med, med schools like to see that committee letter if it's offered. So just to um, throw that into the ring as well. And um, to answer your question in terms of what fun things you did, um, I chose classes outside my major that were kind of fun. I took a yoga and drawing class. So you can get credits, which actually, um, would also boost your GPA a tad um, that are fun depending on where you go. So that, that was where I saw it, um, some fun activities. 
I was just going to say that it's really important to you have all of these different things that you can be doing, but you don't want to do all of them superficially, like Spencer said, just to check the boxes. I focused really heavily on research, um, which did sort of end up hurting me in the end because people were always asking, well, why didn't you go get your PhD? Um, so you want to make sure you have a different range. Like you definitely want that clinical experience, um, but don't do things just because you think you have to do them. Um, you want to be able to answer interview questions about it. You want to show that you're passionate and that there's a reason that you did um, the extracurriculars that you did. I'm going to jump off of what Michaela said and um, add a little to it. And I'll say like, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in your schoolwork. Um, but it's important to kind of step aside and realize that these other experiences that you could be having are also adding to your education and to your future um, career. So for me, a big thing is I really like going to events and I really like learning um, new things about different cultures or just like new topics. And so if I find something interesting, I'll make time to do that because I find it um, that it'll be valuable toward my education in the future. Absolutely. I totally agree with you guys. I One thing that I did personally, I volunteered at this free clinic for over three years. And I still, when I go to back to Austin for holidays, I still volunteer. I enjoy that. I love it because my patients, they, they know me. Then I scribe and they know that I speak Spanish. So they'll look for me. Uh, they follow me around and they ask me questions. I don't even know what's going on with them, but they think I know. It's it's lovely. I have so much fun and it's something I don't see it as a volunteer. I see it as, you know, something I want to do. And it's really easy for me to talk about that. And that's how you should look at an event. You should look at an opportunity that you want to volunteer for something that you can't just get away. It has to be addicting. And I kind of got addicted to that. I tried every single Monday night I was there and it's something that I put in my schedule even now to this year, I still do it. I think it's really fun. So do something that way you have fun with it too and you're learning. Another thing is I was very fortunate that I went to a very small college that was very, I was able to get close to my professors. And so reach out to them, see if they can help you in any way. Um, my professors are very kind in the sense of after my senior year, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, and I was very fortunate enough to get in contact with a previous alum who was a dermatologist and I scribed with him for two years while doing my master's of public health. And so I got another recommendation letter through him. And so, you know, get in touch with your professors or the people on your medical committee, anything like that, that could kind of help you, um, even if your route is maybe not going to medical school right after. They can at least talk to you and give you suggestions of what to do. Thank you, Dimple. And honestly, I mean, I'm from UT Austin, right? That was really hard too. For example, if you're taking biochemistry, the first class, there's so many people there. And I, I could relate to, it's really hard to get to know your professors. Um, yes, you were definitely lucky with that. But I think that Towards the end, once I got more specific with my biochemistry um, major specific classes, like there were 20 of us, maybe there was 30 of us, um, I had to break a little bit of, out of my shell and kind of step up and be like, you know what, I have a question. Even though if you knew the answer, just be like, hey, I kind of have a question. Um, and just, I don't know, talk to them. They, they want to get to know you. Some professors do. Some of them, you know, there's not much you can do. but Definitely knowing who to ask for a recommendation letter, someone who knows you, someone who is just not afraid to tell them, hey, this is an amazing person, and this is what they've been doing this whole year. Um, yeah. So we have a question from Daisy in the chat. If you could go back and give your junior self in college a piece of advice, what would it be? Have fun. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time working to pay my way through school and trying to get all of my like prereqs done and get good grades and everything. And I graduated college looking back saying, I didn't have a lot of fun. Um, 
you have to take care of yourself. Um, so you want to make sure that you do get everything, but your mental health and your relationships with friends and family are just as important. So. That's a great advice, Michaela. I think that's something that I will tell my junior. So I was a transfer. So I did two years in community college and then I transferred to UD and I just jumped into this pre-med crazy life of like study, 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 study. Like you have to be competitive against each other and like you can't like get an A because it's just, it's really stressful. That, that whole life is stressful. And just to let you know, here in medical school, specifically here in our school, it's everyone helps each other. It's wonderful. So that life doesn't continue. But the pre-med can, life can be rough. Um, nobody, a lot of people don't want to help each other. So I think that taking the time and realizing, hey, am I ready to apply to medical school? I'm not doing it because my friend here is applying or because everyone in my class is applying. Like you have to look into yourself. I fell into that. And I felt that I, I had to apply when I applied because everyone that I knew was applying. And I should have I should have told myself, hey, are you ready for this? Or is your application strong enough? And it wasn't, I, I knew it wasn't. So I think that looking into yourself and really get to know yourself and ask those questions, those hard questions to yourself, are you ready for this? And I should have waited a little bit longer. I should have gone to know who I was. And um, I wish I would have told myself many years ago. I'm going to twist the question just a, just a little bit and say I, I've really been, I, I love my journey. Like I'm happy with, I, with the experiences I've had and, and who, what it's, who it's made me and, you know, the better student that, that, I, that I am now than I was then. If I could go back and tell my junior in high school self anything, I would say take a gap year. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for taking the time to figure out uh, what what journey to uh, what your journey is going to be. And, uh, you know, my, my goals have changed many times. I thought I, I wanted to be a flight nurse. But by the time I had enough, I had enough clinical experience to do that, you know, the, the money wasn't there. And I was already had my sights set on, you know, nurse practitioner or something. And so my goals, while I've always wanted to be the best healthcare provider I could be, my goals and my path to get there have changed many, many times. And it's, that's been the story for a lot of us. We, we got a guy in our class who was, who worked in commercial printing for 20 years, didn't have a college degree until he decided he wanted to go to med school. And then he went and picked up a college degree and he's one of the, he's an incredibly hard worker. He's an amazing student. Um, and so, you know, don't do that necessarily, but uh, you know, be okay, be easy on yourself if it takes time for you to figure out exactly how you're going to go about this and and what it's going to take for you it don't don't, don't beat yourself up about it because there's there's value in the journey always thank you spencer and i agree with you i mean learning from your mistakes mistakes are good don't be afraid of making them we're all here. We're all going to get where we're supposed to get. And um, I was excited to take two years off. I relaxed. Not really. I worked a lot. But uh, it, it was a change of mentality from studying really hard to working, break, and then jumping into more studying. It's, it was nice. Um, but I guess another question I could ask if we don't have other questions coming in. Um, let's see. Can you guys talk to me about what your day is like? Um, I know we have a couple of first years, so first years, if you could talk to me about, you know, what it was to start med school, um, what does it look like, what does the load look like, et cetera. And second years, you, you guys can go second. <laughs> okay, I can, I can jump on this first. Um, so we started med school in a pandemic, which is very different than a traditional med school scenario. Um, so the way, and with med school, you kind of just jump right in. You don't have syllabus week. You don't have easy days. You know, you're just, you just jump right in. Um, and so the way it works, I mean, as of right now, how we're doing thing is, things is we get our lectures for the week. Um, we can kind of do what we want with that. Um, so if you're a very organized person and you can 
split it out how you like. So that works well for some other people who like to sit and lecture. That doesn't work so well. Um, but that's been my experience is that I, I just do lectures and study and have a study buddy and <laughs> you get through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely been a difficult transition with, and my cat's going to come say hello. I'm so sorry. Um, with everything going on um, with the pandemic, but for me, it was more about getting back into the swing of studying after working and taking those um, couple gap years off. I definitely, I'm still in the mindset of I haven't been taking time for myself as much as I should because um, I am constantly studying all the time. I wake up 7 a.m., start studying. Um, I end probably somewhere around 9 or 10 at night. I try and take time for food in between. <laughs> um, although I have gotten better at like taking weekends and some nights off to do stuff with people, but it's it's a marathon though. So you kind of have to make sure you don't wear yourself out, but it is a lot of work, but it's not difficult. Everyone will tell you how hard medical school is. The content isn't difficult it's the workload and so if you're prepared for all of that and you're ready to just keep grinding and keep going you're going to be fine there's there's this amazing and very sobering moment in first year where one of our great professors uh, sits us down and we we, we did a we did a pre uh, some pre-work for it where we he gave us a sample lecture and uh you know we spent some time with it and then he sits down and he goes okay so how much time did it take you to watch that which is, you know, roughly how long it is. Maybe, maybe you watched it one and a half X. And then how long did you study it outside of that? Now you're going to have about 15 of those a week. Now let's take a calendar, let's take a planner and let's doodle in like your study time. And he sits there and like has this block out time. And it's very sobering because you realize how quickly uh, your time goes away because a lot of us spent three or four hours on that one lecture. You quickly go, okay, there aren't enough hours in the week to do that if I want to sleep and eat. Um, and so it, it, it just, so that kind of ties into, into what Julia and Michaela were saying, that it's, it's not about the difficulty of the content so much as it is just a high volume, more than you're used to in, in uh, undergrad. And you just kind of have to, it, it kind of, it's like, it's like boxing. You know, everybody always says it's not about like, it, it's not about how hard you can hit the other guy or it's, it's about the, can you get hit and get back up and med school, you get hit a few times and then, you, but you keep getting back up. And then you stop getting hit so much and, you know, you just kind of grind it out every day, like they say, and it's, it, it, it's nice, you know, I think by the second year, second year, a lot of us kind of reach an equilibrium where we, we know what our study style is, we know what our study plan needs to be like, and you can titrate that up or down based on how hard you find that, you know, blocks material and just kind of keep going. So for my first year, I was that crazy med student that had like my schedule. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Oh my goodness. So I would literally wake up at 530 in the morning to go to the gym at six. Then I'd go to lecture. Then we'd have anatomy. Then I would go home and do my notes. And then I wouldn't go to sleep until 10. And then little by little, I started going to sleep until 11 and then 12. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not getting enough sleep. So what I'm trying to say is in medicine, in medical school, you, you learn you learn what's important. You learn, you don't have to wake up that early to go to the gym. You don't, working out, yes, I think is very important in medical school for myself. It keeps me level-headed. It gets that stress out. But if I can't go to the gym one day, that's totally fine. I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Same with lectures. Like I was very organized in terms of like, I need to get these classes done. I need to get these notes done. And if I don't get them done, I'm not going to go to sleep. That's out of the window now. I care more about getting sleep. I care more about having a nice meal and watching something that makes me laugh and distracts me. So as Spencer was saying, yeah, medical school, it's, it's a journey, but you definitely learn like what you definitely learn. Okay. I'm too tired to do this right now. Am I even really, is it worth doing this or should I just get some rest? Quick question. Did you guys do anything before the summer uh, that you started medical school? Did you guys, um, I feel like a lot of people ask, like, did you guys prepare for it before starting medical school? You know what I mean? Like, did anybody do anything? I moved to Arkansas, so I wouldn't have to commute 10 hours a day. 
Um, <laughs> no, uh, um, I know I didn't, but the thing that I, if I could go back and the thing that I've heard from other people is, uh, is, uh, I mean, enjoy the time off for sure. Like, get, take it while you got it. But if you're one of those people, it's like, I have to do something. I've got to prepare some way. Sketchy micro. If I could have done one thing, it would have been sketchy micro. Yeah. Yes. Sonia. Really? Yes. Sketchy yeah. micro? Mm -hmm. That's not the answer I wanted, but okay. <laughs> no, mostly it's like travel, have fun, do something um, as well as, as available, depending on your, the state Ooh. of the world. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you... But if you have to do something, if you feel like you got to, if there's one Fine. like high yield thing to do, it, I would I would say sketchy micro. But but don't yes. don't beat yourself up about it. Take a pass through it and be like cool. <laughs> Anybody do sketchy micro? <laughs> oh, I didn't do sketchy micro, but I guess for me, one thing was. I took two years off and I did a, my master's of public health and I w worked as a scribe. And so I wasn't getting the intense, like I wasn't doing intense studying by any means. And so I guess the summer before, if I could go back, it would be kind of like getting my sleep schedule right, trying to like setting my schedule right, because I wasn't used to having to spend from 8 a.m. of doing three hours of lectures and then having lab from one to four and then four to ten trying to manage doing laundry cooking myself a meal and studying so I would just kind of get my schedule right and learn you know when when are the best times I should be doing this when should I, the best times I should call my parents and my family because that's important too so just managing time better I don't know about y'all, but I just realized yesterday, like, I don't, of course, don't ever leave the house anymore, you know, except to like, go for a walk or whatever. I somehow still get behind on laundry. Like, why? There's no reason, Spencer, you're home all day. But like, the laundry still backs up. Like, it's absolutely shameful. But uh, so I don't fine. know if that's just me or... <laughs> I just made I her totally, a real doll. I totally do it. So I totally was like, oh, I'll do it later. I'll let it run and I forget about it. That's the worst because then it smells weird. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah, it happens. I'm there with you. You always have to let it dry and then you can leave it in there. <laughs> I know, but then I have to let it dry again. So it's not wrinkled. Okay. It's a thing. Oh yeah. I haven't folded laundry since I started school. I just take it out of the dryer when I need it. <laughs> So I think Esmeralda put in a question in the chat. She said, what made y'all choose the medical school y'all are in today? I can start. Um, so a bulk of my concentration outside of computer science was global health and community engagement. I've since college and high school have been really passionate about working with communities and working on the, the determinants of health, working with um, mothers, children, improving infant mortality. Um, so at least for me, it aligned very well with my goals as a future physician and the school's goals that they expect of me. So uh, another thing that Emily just kind of pointed a little bit. So you have to research and get to know the medical school you're kind of thinking of. So the way I started doing that is, first of all, I mean, I'm from Dallas, the Austin area. I mean, all of Texas. I mean, and so I applied around that area. And Texas has like, what, 10 something medical schools. Okay. And then I started branching out, right? So um, oh, good, Esmeralda, like you're from Dallas, yay. Uh, my family's from Conway, so I kind of was like, okay, maybe I can move to Arkansas, uh, maybe Oklahoma, even though I don't like OU. But, you know, like you just start branching up. For me, it was location, and then once I started narrowing it down, I looked at the mission statement, and um, I really liked what NYITCOM um, had to say about just helping vulnerable communities. And that is why I'm here representing LMSA, 
um, just um, representing the Latinos and um, helping those vulnerable communities. And here in the school specifically, they give us a lot of opportunities to go to our neighboring cities, towns, doing some screenings. And um, those individuals just really appreciate us. So that kind of is where I started leaning towards with my decision. For me, the interview had a really big role in why I chose going here. I, you could just tell how much everyone really enjoyed being here and how much the administration really cares about us. And you'll find that as you interview at different places, you get different vibes from different schools. And this one just seemed to really fit with again, like everyone else was saying, like my mission statement and what I wanted to work with and like underserved populations, but everyone enjoys being here and it's a great community and we all like help each other out. And so you want to be somewhere in school that you're comfortable with and that you're going to enjoy the people around you. So. I'm going to, I'm going to risk hurting feelings here. And I'm going to say that uh, I came here because when there's only one option, there's only one choice. Uh, this was this was where I got accepted out of like my 40 some applications. Uh, I had applied to a brand new school that my alma mater was opening and I was like, oh, I'm a shoe in here. Like they're going to want a token old guy. Uh, and I was absolutely devastated when I didn't get in. And um, and this was this was the other the only other school that had given me any play at all. Um, but I had already come here. I had already interviewed, and I had been very impressed by my interview day. The uh, the admissions staff uh, that that met me at the door, like in my in my picture that I sent in, I had glasses and hair, and then I showed up the day of, and I was bald and I had no glasses. And I walked in the door, and she goes, "Hi, Spencer. It's good to see you." I was like, "What? How? This that's amazing." But they clearly knew me. They they and it it, it cemented for me from the beginning that like these people weren't just you know, they didn't just see some numbers on a page, like they knew me as an applicant. And that has become so apparent with everyone in our class, you know, um, the, the aforementioned 40 year old who worked in the printing industry, you know, and we have, uh, we have, we have Emily, who has a software engineering background that I just, I think that is so incredible. A couple of my best buddies here at school are, uh, our former engineers. And it's just, they, they recruit a diversity of, of people here, which in my clinical experience, I've found to make the best doctors, people who can bring that, you know, whether it's a liberal arts background or whatever, you know, to, to bring that into medicine. And so, you know, the, the atmosphere here is just amazing. And I could not have crafted a better atmosphere for me if I made it in a computer. And so I am so lucky. I feel so lucky that I landed here and it's, it's not luck. I mean, it was, it was some me and it was some of the admissions team, you know, uh, knowing that this was going to be a good fit. And so, um, we really do, it keeps being said, but we really, really do look out for each other here. And that's, that's baked into the very way that our tests are graded. If you come in with secret knowledge that only you have, uh, that doesn't help you on a test. That question gets thrown out. It, it behooves you to tell your buddies, hey, I found this great resource. Like, let's all succeed together. And I love that. I, everybody's success is everybody's success. And I, I really do love that about this place. Just to go off what Spencer said too, um, I didn't consider myself a very strong applicant. So I told myself, Jessica, whatever school gives you your first uh, acceptance, you're going to accept it. So I had a few interviews. Um, I think I had like four or five interviews. I think I applied to like 18 schools and NYT was the first interview. Um, obviously I was very nervous. Um, I had, I lived in Arkansas for like four months in Little Rock, but that was it when I was a kid. So I was like, I mean, that's the only tie I have to Arkansas. I don't know anything else about it. So, um, driving up here, I was like, man, this is really in the middle of nowhere. So I was really nervous coming up here, but when I saw everybody that was interviewing the day of, like just even the interviewees, like everybody was super nice. Everybody was very welcoming. And then apart from that, the faculty too, and even, you know, the ambassadors who are there with you during the interview, they made me feel like, wow, I'm supposed to be here. Like I shouldn't be nervous. I worked hard to be here. And then once I got my acceptance, I was like, I said the first school that I got into, I'm going to take. So I took it and that's why I'm here. <laughs> Uh, 
All right. And one last question I got for everyone. Um, personally, I struggled to kind of get a, a mentor during my undergrad years. Um, I kind of went, you know, just like, okay, maybe I need to take this exam. What is this MCAT called? Yeah. So I didn't really have a guidance. Um, my mom, yeah, she's a physician, but she's from El Salvador. So she doesn't, she knows what it is to be in medical school. She can, she's helping me with this long stuff. And I'm like, she's saying it to all in Spanish. And I'm like, okay, this is this, I can't do this. I, I can't. So, but she didn't know the lay of the land here as an undergrad uh, pre-med. So what did you guys do? What kind of resources did you guys use to kind of stay informed? Um, did you guys, I don't know, did you guys get a mentor somewhere? What did you guys do? Well, I think I share the same experience as you, Sonia. My parents are both from Mexico, so like it was really hard to even think about. I mean, my parents always told me to go to college, but I didn't even know what that meant until I was in my senior year of high school. I was like, oh my God, I actually have to take a test and apply to go to college. Like, what is this? So same thing happened with medical school. Like my parents did not have a clue. I didn't have a mentor. When I went to my pre-health advisor at my school, they were like, no, we don't, we don't recommend you. You're not going to make it essentially. And I was like, well, that, that kind of sucks. But my pre-med organization, thankfully they had speakers come in and they were very, they were very helpful. They were like, you guys, like, if this is what you really want to do, don't get discouraged. You're going to hit some speed bumps. That's completely normal. That's life, but you're going to make it if that's what you really want to do. And then when I started working as a scribe, um, those physicians, they weren't just doctors I was working with. They became my friends. Like they were like, Hey, you should probably do this. Um, I'm, it's a good thing that you started doing scribing. Cause they're the ones that told me like, don't shadow scribing was the best thing you could have done. Cause you're getting clinical experience. Um, and you're learning too. So I think most of my mentorship came from the physicians, not so much from the undergrad perspective, unfortunately. But um, yeah, Sonia, like we all left our emails here. If you guys have any questions, please let us know or reach out. We would love to help. Um, I will say that from my experience, anytime you ask someone for help, they, they generally really want to help you. Um, so for me, I went to a really small school and um, they were more geared toward PhD students. So bringing like applying to grad school and stuff. Um, and so... I, we didn't have a pre-med group, you know, so I, I just started asking my professors, I started asking my advisors, and they would just put me in touch with like seniors who were applying med school in that moment. And I would just kind of sit down and like pick their brains over a coffee, you know. Um, and over, over the time, I just kind of figured out what to do. Um, and in summers, I would do internships and work with doctors. So I would again, use them as my mentors. Um, and that seemed to work for me. I think it's also important to emphasize mentorship is not only like when, when do I take the MCAT or what classes do I need to take? It's also an emotional support. This is a hard process. So to have a person that is by your side saying, you got this or don't worry, like it's a hard day and um, keep going. This is your goal. Um, I think that's really important and I wouldn't have been able to get through it without that. This is going to get some funny looks, but um, I, it wasn't really in this state when I was in y'all's shoes, but uh, Twitter is a gross dumpster fire a lot of the time, but I got to tell you, the medical Twitter community is really active. Um, and if you, kind of start wading into those waters and you follow the right people. Um, I try to spend a lot of time on Twitter every week, just, tr just gassing up pre-meds, you know, like celebrating people's, people's acceptances to med school. And, you know, cause I, cause the way I see it, you guys are our future colleagues and, you know, investing, investing in our future colleagues is in our best interest and in, you know, and so, um, you know, I'm, if you give really, if you get in there and you find the right people to follow, you can find med students, uh, and physicians who will like absolutely, you know, get in the DMs with you about about their experiences and advice and like the real stuff, not what you're going to get on Student Doctor Network. Stay away from Student Doctor Network. Uh, probably stay away mostly from Reddit too. They both tend to be pretty toxic pre med communities. And I know I took a lot of advice from there when I was in y'all's shoes, and I, I think a lot of people did too. But man, they build you up for some some grossly overinflated expectations you know I got into med school with a very middle of the road MCAT a lot of us did 
and you know of course if you talk to student doctor network you're not getting anywhere without a 516 and you know 40 publications so just just you know know that you can reach out to other places never be afraid to touch somebody touch somebody directly and see if they're willing to interface with you yeah same goes for me my parents own a very small business in Paragold, which is about 30 minutes from here and they didn't know anything but luckily my brother's an anesthesiologist so i was able to reach out to him and you know ask him questions but also i went to the small liberal arts college um and i knew like my the sophomores juniors seniors and i was able to reach out to them and ask them you know what what did you go through like and because i know some people who also didn't get in their first year or even their second time applying and you know like what motivated them to keep going um just things like that because it can be absolutely devastating once you get a, a, a basically a deny from a school and so it's a horrible feeling but to know that it's okay to keep going you know if your passion is in medicine it's going to happen one way or another so just you know keep following your dreams i know a guy who applied to dental school seven times he got rejected six times and I, th he had more stamina than me, uh, but he's in he's in dental school now. So in three years, they're going to be calling him doctor. So, d you know, don't don't worry about the the R's. I also have a friend that took the MCAT seven times, which is the max you can take. And she was like, I need to get in, and she's in medical school now. The last time was the time. Yep, you can do it, guys. You can do it. <laughs> wow. Wow. I wish I would have heard this when I was an undergrad. I definitely, you always hear the good stories, the good, oh yeah, you apply here and there and you get in. No one tells you like, yeah, you can get rejected and you're supposed to keep going. You don't stop. You keep going. If you want this, this is what you want. You keep going. And like right now we have a test. I know coming up in a week, we got this guys. I, I'm feeling a little it's a lot it's a lot but it's totally if this is what you want to do and just picture your patients and that's all that helps me kind of get a little bit of motivation yeah it's definitely that's something i really want to emphasize is it's okay not to get out on your first time yeah i applied twice this was my third time finally got in um but you just have to like spencer and everyone else was saying if you're really passionate about it and you keep trying you keep improving your application it's gonna happen, but don't get discouraged just because it doesn't happen the first time or the way you think it's supposed to happen. Thank you. All right, so it's about 6.32. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Um, Esmeralda or Daisy, just before we end the night, you got our emails, uh, feel free to email us. Um, we will probably not get to you really quickly, but we will get to you. <laughs> like you heard, we have a lot going on, but we are more than happy to help you. A lot of us are on social media. Like, tw I mean, we got Spencer on Twitter all the time. I see, I see you retweeting. It's not once a week. I see you every day, <laughs> but just, just know that you're, we're here for you. I know LMSA national has a mentorship program. Uh, for it, which is free, which is a big deal. You guys, I think a lot of people are like charging you for advice. That's don't, that's ridiculous. Don't do that. There's plenty of us. There's, I'm sure there's like 20 other people who are, we're doing more episodes or that want to help you. So we'll see you. I believe our next episode is coming up. Ooh, Jessica, do you remember when that is? November. I think it's the 17th. Thank you, Emily. The November 17th, and we're doing the MCAT edition, okay? So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. You guys have a good night. Thank you, student doctors. Thank you, everyone who helped me put this together. We'll see you November 17th.